comes from a word that is mean or that is defined as the end time prophecies concerning the coming of Christ. And so that would include the book of Daniel, that would include the uh, book of Revelation and all of those prophecies found throughout the New Testament and Old Testament that pertain to the dispensation beyond the 2,000 year dispensation. It just so happens that this particular subject um, begins in prophecy for Israel sometime around the time that they went into Babylonian captivity. We do not know exactly when this particular uh, prophecy of Israel being chastised or being subject to uh, the correction of God for a period of seven times. We simply know that it began when he began to punish them for their idolatry somewhere around the time they went into Babylonian captivity. And the church say amen. amen. And so given that consideration, the period of time known as the times of the Gentiles, which covers 2,500 520 years, um, it positions itself somewhere in a mystery. That means that there is no clarity as to exactly what day and uh, what time it began. But we know that it runs from the time that Israel went into Babylonian captivity into the church dispensation, which is coming to its close rapidly, which is 2,000 years, and into the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Can we say amen? amen. Now, we'd love to give you some additional things. We probably will try to give you these things at the close of Bible class, that is additional information and revelation. But we want to stay focused on the subject we have before us, and that is that Jacob bowed before Esau seven times when he was restored in his relationship or reconciled in his relationship to and with his brother. That's found in the book of Genesis chapter 33 verses 1 through 3. That was in fact an act which uh, was prophetic concerning the time that God would deal with Israel and chastising Israel because of their idolatry and their unbelief for what is referred to as seven times. Now let us then now go back to the 26th chapter of the book of Leviticus. For those of you that were not here on last night, you missed this. So we're going to give you an opportunity to revisit this on tonight. Leviticus chapter 26, we're interested in verses number 11 through 17, verses 18, verses 21, verses 24, and verse number 28. Leviticus chapter 26. Again, um, verse 11 through 17. I guess it would be proper to say through verse 18. Also verse 21, verses 25. Verse 24, I'm sorry, and verse 28. Now, it's quite hot outside. I'm sure we have to all agree it's about 96, 98 degrees. And if you think it's hot, turn to someone and say, don't miss the rapture. Because if one misses the rapture, the experience of uh, eternality in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone is far beyond uh, human comprehension. This is torment that the human mind could not possibly conceive. The reason that is is because uh, God has so designed us in the dispensation of man mankind that when we in fact uh, reach a certain level of pain, our uh, anatomy and physiology shuts down uh, because the human body can only take so much pain before one passes out or one becomes unconscious. But in the lake of fire, those who are cast into the lake of fire, which was not prepared incidentally for man, but it was prepared for 
the devil and his angels. Those that go there with the devil and his angels because obviously they would have allowed themselves to be deceived by the devil and his fallen angels. They would have allowed themselves to live like the devil and his angels. Uh, they will not pass out of existence. Now the Catholic Church is trying to amend their doctrine uh, with respect to the uh, subject of eternal damnation or eternal judgment. Eternal judgment is one of the six principles of the doctrine of Christ and they are trying to, to mitigate the consequences uh, I would imagine because of the philosophical opinions of the new generation that is coming into power in all of our ranks and particularly in their ranks. But you can't change the word of God. Can we say amen? amen. If you change it, God will not change because God cannot lie. So it doesn't make any difference what any denomination does, including the PAW. Uh, the word of God stands on its own merits. Can the church say amen? amen? That said, now let us go to the 26th chapter of Leviticus. And as is our custom, we're going to ask everyone to read, everyone to get involved, everyone to participate. The first of the reasons is turn to your neighbor and say this train carries no sleepers. If you will get involved, brothers and sisters, you will not fall asleep. If you are, will participate, you will not doze off and allow yourself to uh, allow what is being taught to pass completely over your head. And then number two there is an impression the word of God makes upon us when we read it for ourselves that it cannot make when we sit there looking off into space or while someone else is reading it in our hearing. And then there's a scripture in Romans 10, 17 that says the word of God is nigh thee, nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart, the word of truth. And so this is where we want it tonight. We want it in our mouths and in our hearts. Can the church say amen? amen? So let's begin with Leviticus chapter 26. This is, again, the Levitical law that's given by Moses to the Levites uh, to govern their um, ordinances, to govern their con conduct and ministry, and to be taught to the people of God. Verse 11, and I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. This is the tabernacle again would be a type of the New Testament church. The tabernacle in Moses' day, um, it had two rooms. The first room was the sanctuary. It was 10 by 10 by 10. And with that meant it was uh, 1,000, oh, excuse me, it was 10 by 10 by 20. I correct myself. It was 10 by 10 by 20. And if you multiply these cubics, 10 cubics by 10 cubics by 10 cubics, this was 2,000 cubics. And these 2,000 cubics in prophecy were a type of the 2,000 year church dispensation. And then the second room was the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in which was the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the golden cherubim. And of course the golden pot of manna which symbolized the word of God, the rod, of Moses which symbolized the authority of God and of course this was inside the Ark of the Covenant and this symbolized the millennial reign because that room was 10 by 10 by 10. It symbolized the millennial reign in which the throne of God will be here on earth for Christ will reign after the 2000 year church dispensation in the earth and there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men for 1,000 years, known as the, the millennial reign of Christ. And it, this then will come to pass, uh, the ninth chapter and the sixth verse of the book of Isaiah, um, that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of his rule, there shall be no end. Uh, to order it and to keep it on the throne of David. So he will be establishing David's throne um, when the 
millennial reign follows the rapture of the church and the seven-year tribulation period, he will be establishing David's throne or David's reign for 1,000 years during that period of time that is typified, if you will, in the room known as the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. So he says here, I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. This is because it was a typology. It was a pattern of that which in his foreknowledge he had ordained to bring to pass in the future. So he turned to someone and said he knew what he was doing. And Israel uh, was in fact those that he used um, to demonstrate to the church the things he wanted the church to know in the church dispensation to carry us into the reignship of Christ or into eternity to reign with him during the millennial reign and then to share with him as heirs and joint heirs with him in eternity. Can we say amen? amen. Verse number 12, and I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt every one that ye should not be their bondmen and I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go up right. But if ye will not hearken unto me, will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you Terah, consumption and burning argu or agu that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and ye shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it this will be the punishment of uh, Israel if they break his commandments can we say amen verse 17 and covenant and I will set my face against you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. It is seven times. It's the same uh, thing that um, uh, Jacob did before Esau. When he came back to reconcile his relationship with Esau, uh, he bowed before Esau seven times. And for those who were not here on last night, you have to understand that seven times has to do with seven times the judgment of God for Israel was a year for a day. The Jewish year is 360 days based on a lunar calendar. And so... A seven times would be seven times the 360 day lunar year of the Jews or seven times a day for a year. If you multiply seven times 360 days and a day is given for a year or a year for a day in judgment, that is 2,520 years. And this is what it is in prophecy. We will see it again as we read down, uh, uh, jump down to verse number 21. If we uh, want to read this again, let's read it again. Verse 21. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven more times, excuse me, seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. There it is again. Let's jump now down again to verse 23 and 24. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. We'll show you shortly. That seven times is seven times 
360 days of the Jewish year, Jewish year, and the Jewish year in terms of judgment of Israel, God appointed in judgment a year for every day. Seven times 360 days is 2,520 days. God appointing a year for a day, that's 2,520 years. This is the appointment of judgment of God Almighty to Israel because of their breaking the covenant and breaking his commandments. Now let's go over to verse 27 and 28. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. There it is again. Can the church say amen? Turn to someone and say, there it is again. All right, Ezekiel chapter number four. I will give you now what the scripture says concerning prophecy and God's dealing with Israel in judgment. In prophecy, in God dealing with Israel in judgment, he appointed them a year for every day. Now you have uh, uh, another example. We've given you one here. There are other examples. This, this should be sufficient. Uh, you have when the spies went into the promised land. To spy out the promised land, they were there for 40 days. And they returned to Moses. Uh, the 12 spies, 10 of them gave a Majority report. And their majority report was a report of unbelief and unwillingness to do what God had commanded them to do. They said, well, the children of Enoch are giants. And, of course, we can't go in there and possess the land. Uh, but Joshua and Caleb stood up and said, no, let us go into the land at one, at, in, and possess the land at once. We are well able to overcome and they believe God but the 10 that brought the majority report um, influence some two and a half and four million people among the children of Israel to disbelieve God and so God's judgment was kindled uh, raft and judgment was kindled against Israel and he appointed to the children of Israel those of ages 20 years old and upward, they were held accountable, for this was the age of accountability in that day, and none of them could go into the promised land for a period of 40 years because he appointed then a year for every day that the spies were in the land. The trip was only supposed to take 11 days. But because of their unbelief, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 days, and he said... And in one place, he said, that your carcasses may fall. And then he said, and your children, whom ye said, uh, would not survive, your children who did not know right from wrong, I will bring them into the promised land. So in God's judgment of Israel in that situation, it is clear from the scriptures that he uh, determined the age of accountability was approximately 20 years of age. I don't know if this is where they get 21 years of age, being old enough for you to buy cigarettes and, and buy liquor. Um, the world is confused about where it gets anything these days. But the fact of the matter is, this is where God determined the age of accountability for Israel. And so it was, he appointed them a year for every day that the spies were in the promised land. They wandered around for 40 years before the next generation went into the promised land. All right? Now then, or oh, he brought them into the promised land. Now let us then read in the fourth chapter of Ezekiel. We were interested in verses number three through six. It reads, Moreover, take thou unto thee, Ezekiel, an iron pan, every one, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign, 
to the house of Israel. So what is this? Underline that. What is this? It's a sign. It's a metaphor. It's a sign. He is demonstrating a sign, uh, and God is trying to paint a picture concerning the condition of the children of Israel. Can we say amen? amen. So this shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Verse 4. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that, shall, that thou shalt lie upon it, it, it thou shalt bear their iniquity. Read, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel, verse 6, and when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, 40 days. Now it said because the kingdom was split between Judah and Israel. This had taken place after Solomon's death. So there was a divided kingdom. And so for Israel, 390 days. Well, they had already gone into captivity when Ezekiel was saying this because, in fact, um, they had gone into Assyrian captivity. The remnant was taken later on by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylonian captivity with Judah. But for the most part, uh, this was a divided situation because the kingdom had been divided. Are you listening to me? Verse number six, let's read the rest of it. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of, it, of Judah 40 days. Read, I have appointed thee each day for a year. This is how God dealt with Israel whenever he reached that point, or which he did, to judge Israel because of their breaking the covenant, breaking his commandments, and participating in all kinds of spiritual adultery and idolatry, which we see much of in our world today. Uh, this was the, uh, how he dealt with them. And this is why we're showing you the times of the Gentile is God has made it clear that he would punish and chastise Israel. Someone say seven, seven, times. seven times is seven times 360 days. Seven times 360 days is seven times 360 years because he's appointed Israel a year for a day. And seven times 360 years is 2,520 years. Again, which be began for them when they went into captivity. Israel went into Assyrian captivity. Judah went into Babylonian captivity. Um, and this period... In terms of exactly where it began, we have not been able to pinpoint that God has deliberately kept that to himself. It's a mystery. For as I heard Bishop Paddock say, if we could determine the exact day and time that the punishment began for him to punish them seven times, we could determine when the rapture was going to take place. And God has hidden that revelation from the church that knowledge was not available to the sonship according to the first chapter of the book of Acts Jesus himself said it was not given unto to, uh, the apostles and disciples to know the times and the seasons but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from high just, which means just do what I tell you to do and leave God's business to God can we say amen and really that's what Jesus said all along didn't he all right now, so we're going back now. We just wanted to make that point. We're going to go back now to show you now uh, what's happening today. I can't go back over all these scriptures. You're going to have to get the tapes and study the tapes on your own. Let us now go today to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And this speaks to the close of... Because we, brothers and sisters, are at the close of the 2,520 years. Because the majority of the 2,000 year church dispensation has 
been fulfilled. I, I'll show you a scripture as to what conversation I have. The only thing left to be fulfilled in the scripture, I'm going to show it to you. Bishop Herman says it's for them to sign a peace treaty over in Israel between Israel and his enemies. And when they shall say peace and safety, there shall be no peace. Well, that's in there too, but there is a, another scripture that supports uh, what exactly is left in terms of the coming of the Lord. And it speaks specifically to the coming of the Lord. And that scripture is in the fifth chapter of the book of James. And we'll read that in our spare time. We're not going to uh, start there tonight. We're going to start here. Where is here? It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to pick up there. And then we're going to connect these scriptures um, as they are appropriately rightly divided so they fit like a glove. So they do not conflict with each other. Can we say amen? So, um, in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, um, is where we're interested. And we probably may go down uh, to verses number 9. All right, let's read. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Now you do need to underline this because this is a subject that was taught from different perspectives. And I'm going to teach it from this perspective. I want you to pay attention to the detail. Uh, as we are rightly dividing the scripture, let us pay very close attention to what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. This sounds like the rapture. This is not the rapture. You have to read on down to see that this is talking about a period after the rapture. This is talking about a period when we are gathered together unto him to come back to fight the battle of Armageddon. And this will take place in the middle of the tribulation period. We will gather together unto him. When we gather together unto him, and he makes his appearance after the preaching of the two witnesses, Elijah and Moses. Then Israel will look up and see Jesus coming and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And they will acknowledge that uh, he is their Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah. He is their Messiah. But this looks like the rapture, not in this case. Verse 2, read, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, number one, or troubled, um, or troubled neither by spirit, number two, uh -huh, nor by word, number three, nor by letter, as from us, number four, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So this coming of the Lord and day of Christ in this context, he's speaking of the same thing. And the day of Christ here and the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord are the same thing. In this sense, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as, and that one day with the Lord is the millennial reign. If you read through the scriptures where it speaks of the day of the Lord, in prophecy it always speaks of the day of the Lord coming right when he comes to fight the battle of Armageddon, right when he comes to put an end to man's government. Right when he comes to set up his millennial kingdom. In every situation in the Bible, this is where and how it is spoken of. The day of the Lord is referring to the 1,000 year millennial reign. So that said, he is speaking here of the coming of the Lord, the gathering together unto him as that day of Christ is at hand. This is for him to fulfill the day of Christ or the day of the Lord, or for him to come and set up his millennial kingdom, first putting an end to man's government in the battle of Armageddon. Now let's read it and see it. Verse number three, let no man deceive you by any means. He already mentioned uh, four of them, but can we say amen? amen. That you shouldn't be shaken by, but now don't, have, don't, uh, don't allow anyone to deceive you by any means. Read, for that day 
shall not come. Now underline that. For someone say that day. We're still talking about the day of Christ. We're still talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. That day, that day of Christ is also the day of the Lord. Read on. Uh huh. Except there come a falling away first. That's taking place in our day. It is. It's taking place in our day. There is a what? A great falling away. And then there will be a further uh, deception that takes place during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Because the Antichrist will become riding four horses. A white horse, a pale horse, a black horse, a red horse. I don't know if I have them in the order. We'll read it if we have time today. today. But he will, become, he will come riding four horses and he will come with the express intent to deceive. So that he can take those who will be deceived to the lake of fire with him. He doesn't want any disciples. He, the thief come up to steal, kill, and destroy. And the act of stealing is stealing something that you have that's of value. When in order for him to steal it, he has to deceive you. In order for a thief to break in one's house, they have to not know he's coming. So he's to come when, he, when they don't expect it. So now look at what you just read here. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now this is the Antichrist. So that day is not going to come in until the Antichrist is revealed. And when will the Antichrist be revealed? In the middle of the tribulation period. When the abomination, which make up desolate, when he goes in after uh, coming in with flatteries, oh, that's the first horse he's riding, the white horse, then he gets into a position, he deceives Israel, they enter into a covenant with him and agree that he, thinking that he is their Messiah, of course, obviously, and that he's going to break the covenant. The book of Daniel said that he's going to break the covenant and set himself up in the temple over in Jerusalem where the current Muslim mosque of Omar is sitting. He's going to set himself up in there and he's going to become the abomination that maketh desolate. And it will be this time that Israel will pass, the rebels will pass on the, under the rod, the 20th chapter of Ezekiel, the rebels of Israel will be purged out. The 144,000 will be caught up and stand before uh, uh, God on the sea of glass, which we'll read tonight. And the rest of Israel will go into the wilderness where they have a place prepared for them for a time, one year, times, two years, a dividing of times, which is the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. So Israel's millennial will begin in the middle of the tribulation period. The rest of the world's millennial will begin at the end of the seven years. And that's what gives God a little time at the end of the millennial ring to release Satan out of his prison to deceive the nations one more time. That's only so that the earth that was baptized by water in Noah's day can be baptized by fire at the end of the millennial reign, the sixth day. We get our baptism in water when we're baptized in Jesus' name. We get our baptism in fire after we're put on the threshing floor. After receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so the fire is the fiery trials which come to try us. And the earth is going to go through the same renovation process. Are you listening to me? All right, so now... This is when the day of Christ is going to come. When the man of sin is revealed. That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That is the Antichrist, if you're keeping notes. And what is he going to do? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He's going to say that uh, that wasn't Jesus Christ. I'm Jesus Christ. I'm God. And, and of course many people are going to take the mark in their forehead or in their uh, hand because they're not going to be able to buy a sale unless they take the what? 
the mark of the beast. So this is what this period is speaking to. Verse 5, remember ye not that, I, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Turn to someone and say, he told you. I'm being a little facetious, but this is what we're supposed to be telling you. We're telling you the truth uh, and no lie. Can the church say amen? amen. Verse number six. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be, be, re, might be revealed in his time. Now this pronoun, him and he, is referring, uh, Brother Brisbane, to the Antichrist. Can we say amen? amen? Verse seven. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's, that was in that day 2,000 years ago. And he, the, at the spirit of the Antichrist, has had 2,000 years to get progressively worse. Jude said, certain men crept in unawares. John said, in the last days, Antichrist shall come already are there Antichrist among you. And here, Paul said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's three witnesses. That it began 2,000 years ago. It ought to be pretty bad by now. So um, uh, people among the, us as apostolics need to cut out the complaining. Okay. You should expect to see the foolishness that you okay. see. You should expect to see the nonsense. Not that we are casting aspersions on anyone. We're not doing that. But we're calling a spade a spade. It is what, in your language, it is what it is. So it's no need to trying to make it be something when it's not what it's supposed to be. Can the church say amen? amen. All right, so now, the, for the mystery of iniquity, doth already work, verse 7, only he who now letteth, the term letteth is a word that has become archaic. It was in common usage in 1611 when the, the, the Bible was translated into British Elizabethan Ang English. Much of that English is not spoken in America, is not American, contemporary American English today. Many of those words have become ar archaic, which means no longer in common usage. So this term here, now letteth, this means hindereth. Means just the opposite of what the term let means today. We think about let today, it means to allow. But in that day, the term letteth meant hindereth. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he, the church, be taken out of the way. The only thing hindering the Antichrist is the church. We're the only thing standing between the, the, these particular course of events and uh, uh, the God coming and finishing up. He has to finish his work through us. I'm going to give you a scripture in just a second to show you. He has to finish what he's doing with his church. And when the last persons or person receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Jesus, uh, 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 and the water baptism in Jesus' name, and is translated uh, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, whenever that is and whoever that is, I don't know, but he'll know, the rapture will take place. The clock is set. And no one can stop it. But the only thing hindering the manifestation of the Antichrist, which when we're gone, then the tribulation period, it begins immediately. And the course of events then can be clocked because you can now count the days and time for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period all the way to the end of the tribulation period because it's in prophecy. Amen. Can we say amen? amen? All right. So now... Um, this is us, verse 7, if you're making a note. We are, that is the church, we are he who now letteth. We are he that will continue to hinder until God takes the church out of the earth. Verse number uh, 8, read, and then, someone say and then. Amen. Hold on, let's say it again. Say and then. Amen. Shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him 
whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You see, this is the reason why people are going to be lost. Why are people going to be lost? Because they want to be lost. All those excuses have been removed. When people go to the lake of fire, it's because they want to go there. No one made them do that. They had a choice. It's up to us to save ourselves from this what? Verse 11, then what is the condition of people today? Then read, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And we have seen this happen to people over when people leave us and go off into false doctrine. Well, well I'm so sad. What are you sad about? You ought to be glad it's not you. When you see somebody go off into false doctrine, I've seen many of them, my contemporaries. Um, uh, I grew up with a young man. And he, when we were all being sent out, I'm not going to call his name, but he uh, wanted to go out and pastor. Now he, uh, he, he was following another young man that married um, Bishop Ellis's daughter. I tried to tell that young man he needed to sit down and submit to the authority of Bishop David Lee Ellis. He wouldn't do it. So he went and preached for another woman who had left Bishop Ellis's church unlawfully. And uh, sorry you have to say these stories. I guess I have to tell them. So um, when he went to preach for her, Bishop Paddock had already uh, excommunicated or disfellowship the woman in the council. And so he called me after Bishop Ellis announced he was no longer in good standing with Grady Grace Temple and Seven Mount Shaper. So then I was at the Xerox Corporation. I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, he... I said, now you're married to his daughter. I said, and um, I said, Bishop Ellis doesn't bother anyone. Uh, Bishop David Ellis at that time was known as one of the most liberal pastors in the PAW. I said, now if he disfellowshipped you, brother, I said, when you get to the council, let me tell you what's going to happen. I said, Bishop Paddock is going to disfellowship you. So he did go to the council. Um, no, he didn't go to the council. I went to the council. I guess he did show up. He's standing outside. My wife and I walked in, Sister Combs, and Bishop Pedock was standing in the pulpit uh, at, at that time, District Elder MacRae's church, announcing that this brother was no longer in fellowship. So he went on out. Then when he couldn't get uh, a church going, he went down south, and then Bishop Ellis had to actually go down there and rescue his daughter. And when he went down to the south, called himself starting a church, this other minister likewise followed him down there. And uh, right before the minister followed him down there, he told Bishop Ellis, God told him to go down there and start a church. So Bishop Ellis, I guess, had just assumed he had been given a strong delusion to believe a lie. He said, all right, you're going to preach the last sermon this Sunday. So um, he preached the sermon, he, and they gave him an offering. He went down there, and ultimately Bishop Ellis went down there and brought his daughter back, and the young man that was married to Bishop Ellis' uh, uh, daughter, ultimately they had to terminate the marriage because the young man, he had gone down there, he had gone off into false doctrine, and he just uh, had lost his way. When Bishop Ellis died, and we celebrated his uh, funeral back May 19, 1996. The young man came over a few days after the funeral. He stepped over the threshold in Bishop David Lee Ellis' house and dropped dead. Wow. The ambulance came and got him, took him away. The other young man I'm speaking of that went down there and tried to start a church, he went off into Sabbath day teaching and started teaching the doctrine of keeping the Sabbath day. And both, one lost his life, the other one lost his mind. Wow. Now I can tell you, I can sit here and, and keep you to 1130 tonight telling you one story after the number. It would scare the daylights out of you. And maybe it would scare the Holy Spirit in you. Can we say hallelujah? But the point is, 
uh, it, is, this, it is foolishness to play with God. It's a very foolish thing. And especially when you're called to the ministry, that is not something you want to do is play in that pulpit. You will not be around, around here very long playing in the pulpit. So this is what happens to some. They're becoming a strong delusion to what? To believe a lie. They think it's the truth. I can tell you of others. I tried to warn them along the way, but uh, then I wouldn't be able to get through my, my lesson. All right? Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, the next verse is to build us up. It says that's them. But then he commends us, verse number 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. That's for you tonight. We give thanks to God for you, but we have to tell you about these conditions which will be prevalent in the last days. And we are in those days as we speak, right in the thick of them. All right, uh, let's finish this verse. Brother. Brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the people said right so now um, I see myself in that do you see yourself if not too bad all right let's go now to the because I'm going to heaven by myself I have to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, you should see yourself in perfection. You should see yourself in sanctification. Amen. You should see yourself uh, in glory. You should see yourself in Christ. Can we say amen? amen. We're going back to Revelation chapter uh, number 11. And I think we want, um, well, we read this yesterday, didn't we? Yes. So we're going to go to the cha Revelation chapter number 7. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Let's walk through the book of Revelation. I'll do what I can to give you an outline to the best of my ability. Can we say amen? amen. So I'll start now um, with the revelation. It is not the revelation of John the divine. That heading is wrong. The proper heading for the book is in verse number 1 and 1. The revelation of who? Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. So it wasn't even just for John. It was for God. Uh, God gave it through Jesus Christ to show unto his servants and sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So just want you to understand we're in the book of the revelation of what's his name? Jesus Christ. Now then chapter 1 deals with the oneness of the Godhead in Christ Jesus, as well as him speaking to how many churches? The seven churches of Asia. These um, churches literally existed in that day. There were seven churches in Asia Minor that existed in that day. So he was speaking, first of all, to the seven churches, secondarily, he was speaking to the sum total of the church dispensation because each of these seven churches represent a period of truth during the 2,000 year church dispensation. The 2,000 year church dispensation is also referred to as two days. The first day is 1,000 years. The second day is 1,000 years. And that's also found in, I believe, the book of Hosea. Can we say amen? So keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that these seven churches, if you will, represent the spirit that is found in any of our churches and, um, as you may say, at any given time during the course of the life of an assembly. So you can take what is spoken to in this book relative to the seven churches of Asia where the condemnation of certain behaviors, attitudes, lifestyles, conducts uh, are found and come to the understanding that these things exist among human beings. Human nature being what it is, people coming out of the world into the church, the devil not being bound in the bottomless pit yet, flesh being uh, 
what it is, for in the flesh is no good thing, and they that are in the flesh can not please God. Do I need to keep quoting more scriptures? I will. But the point to be made is then uh, these things that are addressed here can be found in the first three chapters. The things addressed can be, uh, of the seven churches can be found for the most part in any of our churches at any given time. So it is then a book concerning the discernment of Jesus Christ of the conditions of his people during the course of the 2,000 years of the church dispensation. And that's a good point to be made here, brothers and sisters, because that is to say that he has made already provision, if you will, Jesus Christ that is, and laid out in his word a textbook approach as to how to deal with any and every situation, condition, and circumstance that comes into the ranks of our church. Hence, we are told he sits as a spirit of, ju of judgment and a diadem of beauty for those of us that sit in judgment to turn the battle to the gate. So if we're doing our job, <laughs> uh, if we call a situ in situation into question in our local church, in our district, in our council, in our organization, we have it all here. There is no temptation, but such as is common to man. You can't bring us in anything we can't deal with, because whatever comes up in here, we can deal with it. Amen. Now, we have to be right ourselves, so don't get me wrong. We have to be right ourselves, but we can adjudicate these matters, for this is what he has given us to do. All right, enough of that. Um, the, uh, in Chapter 1, it is the oneness of the God in Christ Jesus. In chapter 2, you have the first church age. This wasn't my Bible class, but I have to do it now because I'm out here in, in the deep water. So I have to, in order to bring you back, I have to go through this. So in the first church age, Ephesus, someone say Ephesus. In your spare time, I got this timeline from the late Bishop uh, R.P. Paddock and Bishop Harry L. Herman. This is in within a 2,000 year period. Uh, this covers the church on the day of Pentecost, Ephesus, until 100 A.D. This is the first church age. Much can be said about how these ages shift and how the circumstances and how the conditions, how the times change from one dispensation to the other. Smyrna is the second church that is addressed by Jesus Christ in chapter 2. And verses 8 through uh, uh, verse number 11. And that is an age from 100 A.D. until 313 A.D. around the time when Constantine the Great became the emperor of Rome and put an end to the Ten periods of inquisition, the Neronian persecutions, should I say. And he issued what is called in history, some of you have college uh, uh, humanities history, church history, the Edict of Toleration. He stopped the persecutions and claimed he saw a cross in the sky and that he was converted. And the <laughs> focus of the church shifted. And these things that Jesus speaks to in here uh, took place in that time, 100 at A.D. Of course, this went around the time when John the Apostle passed away. You see, I'm going to throw some things out here. I'll put some things out here so you can make notes. So there's a parable that says um, that his sower went to sow a seed. But, but while men slept, when the apostles, the last of the apostles died, around 96 to 100 A.D., this is what Jesus was saying in the parable. While men slept, an enemy went out and sowed the seed. And this is what happened when the apostles were alive. What did they do? They dealt with things. If there was false doctrine, they held a doctrinal conference. 13th chapter the book of Acts, they ordained, prepared and ordained ministers 
for the office of bishop. 15th chapter, there was an argument as to whether or not the Gentiles had to keep the law, the 613 ordinances, and be circumcised and or eat things that were sacrificed under idols and strangled and with blood. So they held a doctrinal conference and they dealt with these matters. Um, this was the way they handled doctrinal issues. And as soon as the apostles died, even though you're, uh, you're going on your first century and second century fathers, many of them, like Polycarp and others, tried to stand up and took the persecutions. The point is, the doctrine suffered. Someone said the doctrine suffered. The doctrine suffered. All right, then there's Pergamos. Someone say Pergamos. The date of Pergamos found in verses 12 down through verse number 17 is the third church age from 325 A.D. to 500 A.D. Now someone said, why didn't you back it up to 313? Because we give room for the shift to take place. Are you listening to me? And I have a subject I teach called the Seven Churches of Asia. What I attempt to do when Bishop Paddock was alive, after he taught it to me, I attempt to deal with social and economic changes that took place in each of these, also the academic and philosophical changes, so how everything shifted in the old world. Because most of this did not take place in America because Christopher Columbus had not come here along with the map from America Vespucci, that's why it's named America, to so-called find America. So this is not applicable, much of this, to this country at all. This country wasn't even in existence. It's only been in existence for about 275, almost 300 years. Praise the Lord. So these things were taking place in what we refer to as the old world. Now, I don't have time to teach that. You're looking at me like you've seen a ghost. All right. Let's, <laughs> good Lord. All right, the fourth church age is verses 18 uh, through 29. This is a Thyatira. Now, this church age lasted 1,000 years. Think with me now. These churches are referred to as the seven candlesticks. I just gave you the first three, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, that's the first part of the candlestick. Thyatira was from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. You can't hear me? It's going down? This one is? Okay, so do you want to take this? I'll take that, yeah. Okay, bless you. Oh, someone say Hallelujah. That must be the Holy Ghost. Can the church say hallelujah? All right. So I have to tone my voice down. So from verse 18 through 29, this is Thyatira. It is a period and a dispensation, which means a period of truth that ran from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. It represents the center candle of the seven candles of the seven candlesticks. Because it was the longest period in the 2,000-year church age. Now, uh, obviously, this is the period of the reign of the Catholic Church. By 500 A.D., the Catholic Church had full reign in the old world. And no one that would participate in governance or in any position politically of leadership could hold office unless they joined the Catholic Church. And this is what led to what became known as the 30 Years' War. After uh, Martin Luther uh, wrote his 99-page um, thesis during the Protestant Reformation, and you know, that's at my Bible class tonight, uh, this led to uh, Reformation. This also led to a 30 Years' War in which Protestants and Catholics went to war for 30 years in the Old World, and when they signed what became the Peace Treaty of Westphalia, look it up on your Google, they settled that some states would go to Protestants and some states would go to Catholics. And they are still fighting the day. Over there in Northern Ireland, they have been fighting 
Catholics and Protestants for years. This conflict. Simply making a historical point here from verses 18 to 29, a period known as the Church of Thyatira, 500 to 1500 A.D. Chapter 3 and verse uh, number 1 uh, through verse number 6. This is a period known as Sardis. This is the fifth church age. And this is when the reformers or reformation or the light of God began to return to the church. Now you have to, again, read church history to connect that with the scriptures. But that runs from 1500 A.D. to 1840 A.D. Praise the Lord. And this is a period, for the most part, in which reformation came into existence. We understand, you know, there was Martin Luther and then there was John Wesley. I guess he's the father of the what, Methodist Church, is it? And John Knox is the father of the Congregationalist Church. And uh, Martin Luther is the father of the Lutheran Church. And so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, many of the other reformers, John Wycliffe, on and on and on. This is this period in which these reformers emerged, all right? And then in verse chapter 3, verse number 7 through verse number 22. This, well, first of all, I'm sorry, verse number 7 through verse number uh, 13. This, these verses pertain to the sixth church age. Now, this church age is from 1840 to 1940. This has to do with the early um, reformers, John, with the Finney and others who, uh, and Quakers, and those who quaked under the power of the Holy Spirit in the old world before they came here. You will be able to trace their historical roots back to this period. And then into this country, you'll be able to trace the influence to the Quaker states. But beyond that, you'll be able to trace it to the Azusa Street Revival. This is authenticated in history, and you'll be able to see historically. Now, I have what's called a book that is about four feet tall by 11 feet wide called the Azusa Papers. It has the literal testimonies by the hundreds and thousands that are in that particular book on what took place from 1906 to 1909, almost 1910, in the Azusa Street Revival. Even Frank Bartleman, who is the uh, religious reporter who went to report on the phenomenon and God filled him with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Even his writings are in there. So this can be documented from verses number 7 to verse 13. This is an area known as Philadelphia. Now, what was so marvelous about Philadelphia? Because of all the church ages, that is the only church age for the most part. There's one other, but that's the only church age that God could find nothing. He found no fault with them whatsoever. And that is the point I made to our younger brothers coming along when I before I became a full bishop, I said, now you all are arguing about standards and you're arguing about this and that. I said, but now those who set the standards in the early 1900s among uh, those who came into the ranks of Pentecost, they were very careful to make certain that standards were set so that there would be no chance that they would offend God. And so I said, so it's like this. I told a group of young brothers, they were arguing, I said, so you have a child. Do you, I love my child. I said, so you have a backyard in your house. Yes. I said, there's a cliff at the back of the backyard that drops 200 feet. And down below the cliff, 200 feet, a stones, anyone that falls off most certainly will not survive. I said, so when you put the fence up, are you going to put the fence right on the edge of the cliff? So if your children climb over, they just fall right to the death? Or are you going to move it in? So that if in the event that your children jumped the fence and were to have 
uh, room. Uh, they were to be there. There was a, a area there that you could possibly get to them, or call them in before they perish. Well, I didn't look at it that way. I said, but that's the way it is. Whether you look at it that way or not, that's the way it is. It is better to be safe than sorry. Can we say hallelujah? <laughs> and that was the Philadelphian age. They set the standards to be safe so they wouldn't have to be sorry for offending God later on and answer for it. And now today, it seems like these people coming into the church want to find any every way to get as close to sin as they possibly can, as well as get in sin and then deny they're in it. All right. Well, I'm teaching hard. Can we say amen? So these are, and then the final church age is in the 14th verse. That's the seventh church age. That's Laodicea. To the 22nd verse, that's what we're in right now. It is, the, it is the most dangerous church age of them all. And the only thing Laodicea can do is repent. They can't offer God anything but repentance. So no one can boast holiness in this day. According to the scripture. Now, I'm not saying no one's living holy. I'm making the point collectively as a group, we are disgraced. Can we say hallelujah? All right. Might as well call it what it is. All right. Chapter 4 and verse 1 is the rapture. Can we say amen? amen. And then um, in chapter 6, you have the manifestation of the Antichrist. Or chapter 5, you have Jesus Christ as the son sitting on the throne and breaking the seals. He's the only one that has the, uh, that is in a position. Now, isn't this interesting? In this fifth chapter, uh, John said there was a great search that went on in heaven. They, uh, and they were looking for someone to break the seals of the judgments of God to be pronounced on the earth. They searched all over heaven. They searched all in the earth. The scripture says this. They searched under the earth. But the very place they should have started, they never searched. That's right on the throne. There was Jesus sitting on the throne. This is the truth. He was sitting right on the throne. And finally, when they looked on the throne and saw him there, they said, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, he has prevailed. That means he's the only one that was in a position where he never committed a sin. So he was justified in executing judgment on all of those who did. And so he broke the seals in uh, chapter 5. And in chapter 6, uh, this is where the uh, Antichrist comes in by flatteries. Uh, and he is not revealed until the middle of the what? Tribulation period, which we showed you early. And then chapter 7 is where I'm trying to get you. That's why I walked you through this. Because in chapter 7, this is where the finality of God dealing with Israel takes place. This is where he seals the 144,000. Then I'll show you in the 12th chapter where the remainder of them go into a place in the wilderness prepared for them for a time, times, and dividing of times. So here is the sealing of the 144,000. And this group makes up what's called the man child. Are you listening to me? So now let's pick it up in chapter 7, verse number 1. And after these things, now hold it right there. Everyone have it? Did I lose you? Probably did. I want you to find it again, all right? So let's go 7-1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Now, I don't want you to think the earth is flat. Turn to someone and say, the earth is not flat. This is an express this is symbolism. This means that the angels covered the seven continents of the earth. They cover the north, the south, the east, and the west. All right? Uh, and holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2. I saw another angel. Sending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. 
till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, then who are these? Read. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed in hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses taught this false doctrine for many years. And when they used to come uh, to my dormitory in Michigan State, they say it was 144,000. And then I would say, well, is this the number that you all are saying is going to make it? Yes. I said, so uh, what if you are 144,001? And the man looked at me. I said, now think about that. And I slammed the door in his face. Can we say hallelujah? I said, you think about that foolishness and please leave my house. Because this is what it amounts to. This is not talking about um, the individuals in the general population. This has to do with a specific group. And he will uh, seal 144,000 but 12,000 for each of the 12 tribes for a specific purpose. God has a specific purpose for them. They will be used by God during the millennial reign as the ruling element. And they will reign with Christ in the earth as we will. Of course, their position is less than ours because refer, they refer to here in this particular seven chapter as servants. We are the bride and they are referred to as servants. But they will carry the law, law according to the 14th chapter of the book of Zechariah into all the earth. So now, um, you just read it. I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 6, verse 5, I'm sorry, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Aser were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed 12,000. Everyone of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Verse 7, of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now, what tribe is missing? Dan is missing. And uh, the late uh, uh, Dr. Urshan used to teach that this was because Dan may be the tribe that the Antichrist comes from in order to deceive Israel. I don't know that. I have no scripture to back it up. I'm simply putting it out there that his conclusion was Dan was not mentioned because as a lost tribe of the people uh, of the children of Israel, the Antichrist may come from the tribe of Dan. Uh, simply making that point. Can we say amen? Now, then, during this period of time, there is a great multitude that is spoken of in verse number 9. And these individuals are part of, if you will, the... Uh, seven sections of the first resurrection. We don't have time to deal with all that, but I want to take you now over to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation and show you what becomes of the 144,000. Let me say amen. amen. And this should be understood this vision that John has in the 12th chapter, in verse number 1, and we'll read as long as we can through the remainder of these verses, this woman that he sees, this vision of this woman with child, some said this was Jesus Christ and Mary. That's not true. All of this is happening in the hereafter. And the vision that John sees in chapter 12, verse 1, and the subsequent verses of the woman uh, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet is the same vision that Joseph was given in the 37th chapter of Genesis, verses 5 through 11. So if in your spare time you want to see the same description of this vision of this um, woman, 
That same description is what Joseph saw. It's Israel. This is Israel. All right. Let's read. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the same vision Joseph saw in Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 through 11. Read it in your spare time. So what he is saying is God's dealing with Israel. And this then explains or will explain what we just read in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation concerning the 144,000 and then the rest of Israel going into her millennial in the middle of the tribulation period. Let's read that now. Uh, what of this woman, verse 2, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven, Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. This is the devil working in the world system to destroy Israel. By the way, that is always what the devil has been trying to do. They've been, the devil has been using the world system, uh, whether it was uh, Hitler, Stalin, uh, whether it is currently Iran, whoever it may be, the uh, Palestinians, whoever is Israel's, uh, almost everyone over there is Israel's enemy. Uh, this is symbolic, representative of the devil working in every single one of the systems of governance of the world to destroy Israel. This is what the devil will continue to do even through the middle of the tribulation period, which is where we're going now. Read on. And his tail drew a third part of the stars. This is the devil now. Of third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman. That's Israel, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, this is not Jesus Christ. This is the 144,000 that was sealed. And you'll see this later on. Let's read. Mm-hmm. She brought forth a man child. That man child is the 144,000. And what were they supposed to do? Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron? And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And you will see those 144,000 in, I think, the 13th chapter, somewhere in the book of Revelation. They're standing before God on the sea of brass. They're right there where the scripture says that they were caught up before God. Standing before God on the sea of glass. That group will be the ruling element in ter terms of the Jews carrying the law of God into all the earth during the millennial reign. When the day of Christ comes into being and the day of the Lord, when the Lord sets up his millennial kingdom here on earth. So this is what uh, is described in verse number three. The devil working through the world's governance and systems to destroy Israel. Trying to keep this from coming to pass. It's not, he can't stop it. Israel will not be destroyed. It will not happen. Obviously, uh, many of them uh, uh, will lose their lives, but they will not be wiped from the face of the earth. But Iran certainly said that's what they want to do to them. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Can we say amen? amen? Verse 6. And what happened? And the woman, after the, after the, the woman's child, after the 144,000 were caught up, the woman fled into the wilderness where she have a place prepared of God. Verse 6, that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's 1260 days. Mm -hmm. That's the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought, and his angels, the dragon is the devil, read, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now think about that. Right now the devil can go back and forth because he has to get permission. In Job's day, he had to get permission. The scripture says, even the heavens are not clean in God's sight. Because the devil, even though he lost, he was cast from his position, he still has access. 
And that's why uh, when the Lord was dealing with Ahab, he said, who will go down and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab? And so one on his left said this. One on his right said this. And then the spirit said, I will go. And what side do you think he came from? He didn't come from the right side. He came from the left side and went down. It, it does not pay, pay to be a left-wing liberal. liberal. Can we say amen? <laughs> not good. Anyway, from the left side, came down, went down there, and got in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab and caused him to be deceived. He went into war and lost his life. You know the story. Can we say amen? So now, um, this is how it was. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. They failed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. This is when the devil in the middle of the tribulation period will be cast down from his position. This is now the close of the times of the Gentiles. And I showed you in the 11th chapter of the book, a revelation yesterday, it was the close of the, uh, the, the times of the Gentiles, or the fullness of the Gentiles, was for Jerusalem to be trodden under the foot by the Gentiles one more time. And then that, of course, is spoken of uh, to be fulfilled after the two witnesses finish their prophecy for 42 months, 1260 days, or time, times, and dividing of time. All of this fits together. All right, verse 9, let's read. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth who? The whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He will be cast down, and when he is cast down, this will be uh, at the in the middle of the tribulation period, he will go and assume his place fully there in Jerusalem, in the temple, to become the abomination that what? Make of desert. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, let, of course, he uh, will be working through uh, that body anyway, but I'm just saying all of those fallen angels will no longer have access where? To heaven. This is what the point is to be made of this. Uh, there will be no more access. All right. Um, now let's read on down. We're almost finished. Mm -hmm. Verse number 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Now God, what's his name? Jesus. His Christ is the church. If we suffer with him, we shall also Ring with him. Read on. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. Verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. That is, those who had to give their lives during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period by refusing to take the mark of the beast in their, in the fore, either in their foreheads or in their hands. They not only had to live for it, but they also had to die for it. This will be the price one has to pay for eternal salvation if they don't come into the church now. Can the church say amen? Verse number, uh, verse number 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he have but a, what's the short time? Three and a half years. He has three and a half more years. He knows it, and he's going to wreck havoc and destroy like he never has before. Praise the Lord. I was going to say something else political. I better not do that. Can we say amen? Verse 13. And when... The dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. That's Israel. He went after Israel. And this is what the Antichrist is going to try to do. But God is going to preserve her. 
He's going to protect her, just like he did in Egypt in Pharaoh's day. Well, well, there were ten plagues. The plagues came upon Egypt, but down in the land of Goshen, God preserved Israel. So when there was uh, darkness in Egypt, there was sun shining in Goshen. When there were lice in Egypt, there were no lice. When there were frogs in Egypt, there were no frogs. When there was uh, 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 whatever else, flies in Egypt, there was no flies. And so on and so forth. When the death angel marched through Egypt, um, God gave specific instructions pointing to the coming of Christ, of the death of the he lamb, examined for four days, and his blood taken and, and struck across the door uh, lentils and on the doorposts of every single home down in Goshen. And the death angel passed over every home and spared the firstborn. Can we say amen? All right, let's finish reading up. Verse, a short time, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth a man child, verse 14, and two, the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time one year and times two years and a half a time six months from the face of the surface. serpent. Someone say preservation. It's 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. That's Israel. The woman is Israel. The dragon is the Antichrist. It's the devil. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now you want a, a final scripture? Let's go to Job Chapter 6. I'm going, uh, let's hope so, if I can remember. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Is that six or seven? Oh, no, that's, that's chapter 5. I'm right there. I opened the Bible, it fell right on it. Isn't that something? So, this is a prophecy of Israel. Praise the Lord. Unfortunately, I have to use the book of Job for this because of controversy over the things they said to Job. Can we say amen? But this is a prophecy concerning God delivering Israel in six seals. See, the first six seals are the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. The seven seals unlock the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Because The seven seal leads to the seven trumpets, and then it leads to the seven vials. Praise the Lord. See, we have to learn our Bibles. Can we say hallelujah? You need to read them first, all right? Chapter 5 and verse number 17. Let's start with verse number 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of thee. Now make a note of that because he said... Israel, if you tell to Israel, if you don't do what I told you to do, I'm going to chastise you seven times. I'm going to chastise you 2,520 years. If you don't keep my, if you break my commandments and you break the covenant. So here is a prophecy. And this is certainly uh, in line with what we have read tonight in his dealing with Israel. Verse 18, for he make of sore and bindeth up. This is what he is doing with Israel now in, during this period of chastisement where he has grafted the Gentiles in. And uh, he woundeth and his hands make whole. This is how he works. And this is what he is doing with Israel and is going to consummate with Israel in the middle of the what? Tribulation period. Verse 19, he shall deliver thee in six Troubles, that's six seals. Look at this now. Yea, in seven, that's the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, there shall no evil touch thee. So he's going to bring Israel through the sixth seal, the first three and a half years. He, 
20th chapter of Ezekiel says he's going to cause her to pass under the rod and purge out the rebels. And the rebels are going to be lost. So he'll bring that remnant in. And this speaks in prophecy to the same uh, thing. Look at the details here. Verse 20. In famine, he shall redeem thee from death. So he's going to keep her from the famine. Read. And in war, from the power of the sword. He's going to keep her from the sword. Read. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. When the Antichrist says you have to take the mark of the beast or you can't buy or sell, he's going to preserve her from that because he's going to take her right into her millennium in the middle of the tribulation period. So they won't have to uh, be subjected to that scourge. Everyone else will, but not them, and certainly not us. Can we say amen? Read on. We will, they, we're the heavenly seed. They are the earthly seed. God knows how to take, turn to someone and say, God knows how to take care of his seed. So he's going to take care of both of his seed. We're coming out first. They're coming out in the first three and a half years. And everyone that will be saved will be saved by the middle of the tribulation period. This will be the end of salvation. There will be no salvation for people at the end of the tribulation period. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, so verse 21, thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Mm -hmm. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. That's because even though uh, the dragon's going to allow a flood to go out to try to destroy them, the earth is going to help and preserve Israel and keep them. Read on. At destruction and famine, thou shalt laugh. Well, this is not us because we're not going to be here. We'll be in our glorified bodies. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, so Israel shall laugh. Read. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth because they will have gone into their millennial. Then the beast of the earth will be at peace with them. Even when they're in the wilderness, God will preserve them like he did them down in the land of Goshen. Let's read on. Mm -hmm. For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beast of the field shall be at peace with thee. Well, there, turn to someone and say, there it is. Verse 24. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit the habitation and shall not sin. So where they were practicing sin before, at this time, they will have heard the preaching of the two witnesses, looked up and seen Jesus coming and said, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. 1,500 years from the giving of the law to Moses until Jesus died on Calvary, 2,000 years of the church dispensation, and three and a half years of the tribulation period, and they will accept him, and he will impute to them that they will sin no more. By the way, that's how we got it, by imputation. <clears throat> and that's how the Old Testament saints got it, by imputation. And this is how they will get it, by imputation. Praise the Lord. Verse 25, thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great and thy offspring as the grass of the earth. That is the earthly seed. It's going to be great. Because a child shall die at 100 years old. That's in your Bible, book of Isaiah, between 60 and 63. And some people will live in as much as the lifespan of man will be extended during the millennial reign. Some people will live to be a 1,000 years of age. They'll live the entire millennial reign. Because this, the conditions that we know in the earth today that were brought about by sin, for the most part, those conditions will be removed when Jesus is here. Now, they're still going to be death, but not for us, because we will have what kind of bodies? We'll glorify bodies. And that's because our job is to reign with him. We're heavenly seed. Their job is to rule in the earth. Everybody has a job to do. Praise the Lord. All right. That's for the Verse 26, thou shalt come to thy grave in a thousand years of age. Read, like as a shock of corn cometh in his what? Now, the shock of corn is not an ear of corn. The shock of corn is many ears of corn tied together. They're all bound together and 
in each of those ears is kernels, and in each of the kernels is seeds. So that means there will be a multitude of offspring. There'll be, they'll turn to someone and say, there'll be no more abortion. Let me just get to the point around here and make you real mad. There'll be no more killing babies, which they need. God's going to get all of them for what they did. 300,000 African-American babies killed a year, and no one wants to say anything. Shame on you. I love making people mad. All right. Verse number 27. Lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it, and know thou it for thy good. Now, this is as much as I can give you. There's so much more I could have given you, but I run out of time. Over the clock beat me again. I had some good things for you or beyond that. Do you know the seven branches of knowledge according to these know-it-alls in your colleges and universities? You know what the seven branches of knowledge are? There are really eight of them. They say number one is history. They say number two is literature. They say number three is visual arts. They say number four is philosophy. Number five is science. Number six is music. And number seven is religion. And now they have a new one called STEM. You know what STEM is? Science, technology, engineering, and math. This is what they have used to come up with a completely new universe called the universe of social media. So turn to someone and say, away with that. Because that's not going to get you to heaven. The knowledge of man has been made foolishness by God. The wisdom of man, should I say wisdom, really is, it has to do with the knowledge and understanding that they use to what they call their best end. What is that? Someone say foolishness. So I'm just saying to you, um, we're going to be teaching in the councils in the future. We're going to get very strategic in the, in the Northern District Council and teaching, we're going to be get, become very specific on trying to train everyone how to discern with the scriptures so that they can push back on this attack that is taking place on our churches and on our doctrine. And I have to give the commencement speech at Spring Harbor University in November, and I'm going to have to have, to have some very controversial things to say. Not about that university, but about secular progressive university. I'm going to have to expose them in the speech. I've been in prayer. I've got to prepare my speech so I can warn those students. You know, they don't necessarily have all the truth we have, but they can be warned not to swallow the poison. Can we say amen? Because they will certainly are out there spreading it. And we have to train our people how to discern so they can say I'm not drinking from that cup. Or they can say, we will not eat the king's meat. And we will not drink the king's wine. And when they did that, they were healthier than the wicked people who was drinking it. So we want to train our people that you'll be fine. <laughs> the fact that you'll be ready to go to heaven, you'll be fine. If you refuse to swallow the poison they are spreading all around us. It's a terrible thing. Only because I'm so entrenched in politics, business, and education, I see it, and constantly am making more and more enemies every day. They just get mad at me because I won't do it. I was asked to attend a number of things. Uh, as I was asked to, as I said, to attend the thing with Benny Hinn. I said, now why would I do I'm not, well, with um, uh, Joel Osteen? So he wanted me to meet with him and his wife I said, I have nothing against Joel Osteen, but I don't need to meet Joel Osteen. Who he, he spoke, well, he's having. I said, well, you all go meet with him and tell me how it went. I said, and when you get through, tell me how many people got the Holy Ghost and got baptized in Jesus' name while you had it. Now, some people got angry with me about that. I said, I don't care. You know, my, my, your friendship with me is not worth my relationship with God. So if that's the way it's got to be, then that's the way it's got to be. And so... Uh, we think associating with these personalities because we're into personalities make us some 
better than what we are. We are the greatest people on the face of the earth. Not that we're narcissistic, self-worshippers, full of ourselves. It's just that I don't need to look up to any of those people. I have what God has ordained for us to have. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's people are the greatest people on. A toast to God's people. No alcohol. Come and say hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to turn you down to the hands of our pastor. Let's put your hand together and receive him. I say amen. Thank you for praying for me. Because those allergies were working on me again.